Nature and music have always been connected for Melvin Kaplan, founding artistic director of the Vermont Mozart Festival, New York Chamber soloist and festival wins. Oboist, manager, teacher, and music director, Mel Kaplan is my guest, next on Profile. Mel Kaplan was brought up in New York City and went to the Juilliard School of Music, where he started working upon graduation. An oboist, Kaplan stayed on for the faculty for 30 years. In the early 70s, he bought a farm in Charlotte, Vermont, where he soon settled with his wife, Inez, and their children. With friends from UVM, Kaplan founded and became artistic director of the Vermont Mozart Festival, a post he still holds some 33 years later. Kaplan also runs an arts management company representing professional chamber groups and soloists from Europe, Canada, and the United States. He's been honored with the Governor's Award for Outstanding Contributions to the State and the Vermont Arts Council Lifetime Achievement Award. Welcome, Mel. And Needless to say, you've been around the world playing oboe, yeah. and <laughs> of course, and back. It's great to have you here. Pleasure. So you were brought up in New York, I guess the Bronx, actually. I was born in the Bronx. Uh, 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 most people don't even know what the Bronx, why it's called B-R-O-N-X. And uh, a man who was, uh, when we were coming up here in 1971 and decided to live here, uh, a man named Detlaub Bronk, who was in charge uh, of the Rockefeller University, uh, what was then called the Rockefeller Institute, uh, a famous uh, uh, scientist, uh, said to me, uh, gee, he said, uh, uh, I know people who live in Shalott. I said, really? I said, who is that? He says, a man named Dan Kiley. He said, you know, the landscape here at Rockefeller was done right. by Dan Kiley. And so I wrote Dan Kiley and told him that story and ended up getting to meet him because that we, we were very good friends and he, he just died a, a yeah. year or so ago. But Dick Bronk told me that the reason that the Bronx was called that was that it was his family's farm. They were Dutch and it was called, when we go up to that farm, we went up to the B-R-O-N-K apostrophe S and that eventually became an X. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a great story. <laughs> so, so you're growing up in the Bronx. Your family's pretty musical, but you decide to go professional. Right. Of course, why a career in music, and why did you choose the oboe? Yeah, well, uh, 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 there are different answers for that in, in, in different circumstances. Uh, um, you don't decide to become professional, and either it happens or it doesn't happen sort of in your life. Um, uh, I think by the time I was about 14 or 15, I loved playing so much that I thought I would be happy if I could do something like that. It turned out that that was the case. And um, uh, playing the oboe was bizarre. Uh, I, I, uh, before Juilliard, I went to a thing called the High School of Music and Art. Uh, and uh, when you got into that high school playing the piano, which is what I did, uh, uh, they said to you, you had to take another instrument. I know you had to take an orchestra or sing. And um, uh, I went to my older brother who played fiddle, and uh, I said, Harvey, who should I, what should I tell him I want to play? He said, you're too old to learn a string instrument. Tell him you want to play the oboe. So I walked in like a dummy. I said, I want to play the oboe. They said, all right, you'll play the oboe. <laughs> And off you go for the rest of your life. Well, the, right. uh, the odd thing at that high school was that there were no fewer than four instrumentalists in every class. So there were minimally 32 people who played the oboe at Music and Art High School. And you basically were placed in orchestra by what talent they thought you had for doing that. And within a year, uh, I was playing the first of those 32 oboes. Mm. That was uh, mm. very encouraging. Indeed. I mean, well, you don't think of it that way when you're 15, 14 years old. It was just something that was fun to do. Right. Well, you must in a way. And so you go to Juilliard, and you get a, a job is offered immediately, yeah. uh, which is very impressive. But I'm going to jump ahead. Yeah. Um, and there you're a concert master and professor, and you're playing oboe all over the world. Um, incredible career there. But we, we jump. 20 years and you buy Foxhorn Farm in Charlotte right. and move there uh, permanently with Inez a few years later yeah. when the kids start going to school. Where did you get this profound love of nature that made you want to move here I, or, or why Vermont? No idea. I, I, you said that I've always cared about uh, nature and music. I, I don't know that that's necessarily the case. Uh, we got much more involved in the farm av having bought the farm. but. Uh, 
uh, as a kid, I grew up very close to the Bronx Botanical Gardens, mm -hmm. and I really loved them. I, I spent a lot of time there. I could walk there. I mean, I, it, I didn't have to take a vehicle to get there. And um, uh, we really had friends who had bought a farm in Shalott in 63. They bought 600-acre farm and begged us to come up and see them. We had taught them each uh, musical instruments, uh, the kids and, and the mother. And um, uh, we... we uh, Finally, in 1971, we had a, a moment between weeks at the Bennington Composers Conference, which we had done for a lot of years, mm -hmm. and we said, okay, we will come up and see you on that Sunday. And we were quite floored by the Champlain Valley. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, it was, a, it, as you know, it's astonishingly different from Bennington, which is like mm -hmm. the Berkshires. And um, uh, we said, well, that was the, towards the end of August always, we said, gee, the thing is over at the end of August. Can we come up and spend a few days before, you know, around Labor Day weekend? They said, sure. So we came back and found a piece of land wow. that, that we liked and, and thought we would just put it away. And the land had a barn on it. And uh, um, uh, someone had made an investment for something for us that we had never expected to have. We had a few dollars, and we thought maybe we'll convert the barn into a house and rent it to someone to, from the university and use it in the summer and found that we hated leaving it, which was the last thing in the world I would expect. Uh -huh. I'm a New York kid. <laughs> right. And, and uh, so a year later, we rented the house out to one of Dan Kiley's daughters, to Antonia. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and I went up every couple of weeks to see what it was like. And the year after that, we moved in with the kids and figured we would try it for a year and see what they thought of it at school. But it was sort of crazy. We were playing. Hmm. 50 concerts a year in New York. Well, yeah, yeah. so you keep an apartment in, in New York. Right. You continue as professor at Juilliard, right. and this goes on right up till 1980. I had an office in New York, too, yeah. Right, and yeah. an office in New York. When did you begin the arts management business? Uh, you know, in a funny way, because I began representing a woodwind quintet that I formed at Juilliard when I was 18 years old. In an odd fashion, I began in the business part of music from hmm. that time. Hmm. Uh, that got much more complicated in my early 20s. I mean, between... Uh, 21 and 28 or something like that, and eventually it was put into a, a more formal structure, I mean, a, a corporation mm -hmm. that represented right. artists. And wasn't it risky to move out of New York, the center of the uh, business? It, it, it was so risky that uh, uh, for a number of years, until we stopped that office in New York City, I had the phone that rang in the office in New York rang in my office here in Vermont. <laughs> they uh, I, never knew. Which they charged a fortune for. Uh, because, and there was no such thing as an 800 number. I mean, there were no computers, etc. Mm. Uh, so for doing that little switch, they charged a great deal of money. But I was, in fact, because nobody at that time conceived of that business being anywhere except New York City. That's much less the case now. Right, and a lot of people have followed your... The, that's correct, they have. Yeah. And in fact, <coughs> Frank people Solomon, do. who um, uh, has managed Marlboro, the Marlboro Music Festival mm. forever, uh, and had a house there, eventually put his office also there, as hmm. well as uh, in New York. Right. Yeah. So the, the year that, that you move up here more permanently, and you're still on the faculty and you're running right. around the country, you work with Bill Metcalf and James Chapman in, Chapman in conjunction with the UVM Lane series right. and began the Vermont Mozart Well, Festival. what really happened was that uh, Jim came over. Uh, I, we, we had known him for some reason from uh, something that had been done maybe down in Bennington at some point. And uh, he brought over Bill Metcalf and introduced us to him because at that time, Bill, who was a history professor, ran the music department. He was an interim chairman while they were searching for somebody. And uh, they asked me, in essence, whether I could dream up something to do in the summer. And strangely enough, this is what we dreamed up. So what, what was that concept? Where did you... Was this being done much in the States? I mean, it's such a, there's a European right. tradition about what the Mozart Festival is, that right. all of these different that's, venues. That's because we played at a lot of those festivals in Europe, and somehow or other that sunk in. I remember you're asking me a question at some point or other about uh, what, how do you construct something like that? And the answer really is that it's a synthesis of sort of a whole bunch of things. In truth, any concept like that comes from, it's like a synthesis of all your life. Right? And so it's a mixture of playing, loving to do programs,